Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Brian Craddish with the Harris County Public Library, and I would like to welcome all of you to today's presentation of the Texas Master Gardener Program with Texas A&M AgriLife and the Harris County Master Gardeners. Our Green Thumb Gardening Series is the third Tuesday of every month, and we are here this month with Teresa C., our Advanced Master Gardener, to talk about fall vegetable gardening. So before I bring Teresa on board, I just want to do a couple of quick housekeeping tips. Um, please be sure to put your questions and comments in uh, in the comment section. We love to answer questions. Um, Teresa can talk a whole bunch about fall vegetable gardening, but we really want to hear what you would like to know. So in the comments, let us know where you're watching from. We love to get viewers from all around the country, not just Harris County. Um, let us know your questions. We, we may ask you for some um, feedback or some additional explanation on your questions if needed. We'll try to answer what we can on air, but if we can't answer it live, we have our Harris County Master Gardeners will be actually answering in the questions as well. So if they don't get to your question during the program, keep an eye on the replay. You can go and, and watch the questions and get, and get everything answered there. We also have all of our previous uh, Master Gardeners programs available on the uh, Harris County Public Library YouTube and Facebook pages. And we'll sign, we'll, we're casting right now both to YouTube and Facebook. You can watch it wherever you like. We keep an eye on the questions in, in both locations. And we keep an eye on the questions if you're watching it on the Harris County Master Gardeners Facebook page as well. Um, please make sure you like and share. Let us know how much you're enjoying the program. It helps us know that people are, are enjoying and using this and it's easier to plan for our next few uh, few uh, programs. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up our Master Gardener today, Teresa. And good morning, Teresa, how are you? Good morning, Brian, I'm doing great, thank you. Excellent, so I know we've got a lot to talk about with fall vegetable gardening. I'm gonna let you take it away. Let me know when you're ready for some questions and I will be right back. So here we go. Okay, thanks so much, Brian. So I am Teresa C., um, Master Gardener with Harris County under Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. If we can go to the next slide. Th this is part of the Green Thumb series. As Brian has already mentioned, we have a different topic every month. Uh, we do two talks each month, one with the wonderful library system and one with Houston Community uh, System. Be sure to check in next month with Jenny Donahue She'll be talking about herbs and she's like the queen of herbs. Next slide, please. So we have a couple of websites that I highly recommend you get into. It's all kinds of free horticulture information. A lot of what I'm covering can be found in uh, one of these websites. Get into uh, Texas, Harris County, and then vegetable gardening. And you'll see a lot of uh, free information. You can download it or just reference it. Next slide, please. So this is a planting chart that I use all the time. Even though I've had the opportunity to vegetable garden for some years now, I still refer to this. We even updated it uh, several years ago uh, just because climate changes, things change. So the way to read this, um, this is for Harris County. If you're listening from another county like Fort Bend County, uh, Montgomery County, maybe even Brazos County, or even outside of Texas, you might be listening. Uh, try to check with the county that's closest to you. And that way you can tweak and get to the best information for your garden. So you want to go to the county 
that your garden bed is actually in. So across the top, it has January through December, and down the left side, you can see various vegetables that we've listed in alphabetical order. The way to read this is if, uh, if you follow the line across and it's in dark green, that's the ideal time to plant, and light green is still a very good time to plant. Next slide, please. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you've never gardened before and you don't yet have your garden bed set up, you want to first pick a spot that's going to give you at least eight good hours of sunlight. You want to make sure that you're, you have good internal and external drainage. The external drainage is um, if you're going to be gardening in a container, like these half whiskey barrels that are in the front of this raised bed you want to make sure that whatever container you use has drain holes, either in the very bottom of the container or towards the side bottom of the container. Your plants don't want to be sit sitting in moisture. They don't want to be sitting in wet or water. So you want to make sure that you have drainage. Now that's the external drainage. The internal drainage is the soil itself, the uh, media itself. You want to make sure that whatever soil or combination of soils that you're using allows water to drain through. We have clay soil in most of Harris County. All of my friends have clay soil. So I wouldn't want to go out there and scoop up soil from my yard and put it in my containers or raised bed because that clay soil does not allow for water to drain through um, properly. Um, so, uh, the next question, obvious question would be, well, what kind of soil do you recommend? I like to recommend uh, two parts rose soil to one part compost. If you listen to our local talk radio on Saturday and Sunday morning, there is a garden guy that you'll real often hear say two parts rose soil to one part compost. And I think that's a great way to start. Uh, now with me, I like to experiment with different soils. So I might um, you know, after a season or two, I might see a soil in a uh, box store or um, one of the nicer nurseries. And when I say box store, Home Depot, Lowe's, don't want to forget Ace Hard Hardware. They all have wonderful soils as well. So I, I might experiment with some of their soils and, and put them in uh, either an area of a garden bed or maybe I have a small garden that I like to experiment in. So that's all the um, soil and drainage. Now, um, you want to also want to make sure that the area is free of sunlight competition. Think about what is around the area that you hope to be setting up in. Perhaps you have an area like this that you're the picture that you're seeing. What's on the other side of that fence? Um, is it an empty lot? If it's an empty lot, could there be a multi-story built or a, a large house built back there? Also, have you or a nearby neighbor just planted a small tree that's going to get big? So you want to think about the near future and future down the line. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that you, uh, you're considering the path of the sun. The sun, of course, goes from east to west. But right now we're in the middle of summer. So that sun is pretty much straight up when we're in the middle of the day. Whereas in the fall, which we're talking about fall vegetable gardening, that sun is going to be lower in the sky, especially on, on the south side. Um, and that's, uh, you, the sun is going to be coming lower as it comes across the sky. So when you consider the, the sun and the path of the sun, you especially want to make sure there's nothing going to block the sun from the south or west side. That's where you're going to be getting your strongest and best sun. You also want to make sure that you can get water out to your garden easily. You know, a gallon of water weighs more than eight pounds. So you don't want to be hauling water out to your garden area. Drip irrigation is ideal. That is the best kind of um, water, easiest water you're going to get out to your garden. But not everybody can set that up. So soaker hoses work great. Uh, hose end sprinklers, so sprinklers at the end of the hose. Um, and even I even have some pocket gardens that I just bring my hose out there with a nozzle on the end of it and just spray um, into the garden area. Now, 
you want to make sure that you're not having to wind around patio furniture or the dog's toys or the children's toys, or if you have a dog house out there or your garden containers. You don't want to have to be dodging around things to get your water out there. Try to set things up where it's as easy as possible to garden. Um, so also you want to make sure that you have good air circulation. Something that we have out in our yard that we can't see are microclimates. We have various um, air circulation in different areas of the yard. Now, obviously you can't see this air moving, but what you can do is pick out a few spots, maybe four spots out in your yard that you think will be great. It's gonna be getting the right amount of sun and you should be able to get water out there easily. Put a couple of lawn chairs out in each spot that you think are good candidates for putting your garden area and sit in these lawn chairs different different days, different times of day. And if you're feeling the slightest air circulation on this, your skin surface, then you're probably good to go. But if every time you sit in those chairs, it the air just feels stagnant, then you might consider uh, not using that area. What happens is you can start getting plant diseases and insect infestation if you don't have air circulation. And you also want to make sure that the area is visible. The more you see that garden area, the more you'll be thinking about it and the more likely you'll be in it. And this doesn't mean you have to spend three hours every time you go into your garden. Sometimes I just go out there to look, make sure that the the moisture level is accurate. Uh, make sure there's no naughty insects that are trying to pitch a tent in my garden area. So let's go to the next slide. There's all kinds of um, garden designs that you can pick from. This first one on the top left is just a traditional garden. It's just mounds of soil. Now that is at a large nursery. It's at a grower, but let's pretend that we have these front three garden beds. Now it's just a mound of soil. It doesn't have um, any walls to it. You, the idea is to only make it as wide as what you can reach in, in this case from both sides. So you want to be able to reach into the garden without leaning onto the garden bed or compressing or compacting that soil and certainly not stepping on that soil. You kind of push the air out of that. And I'm going to talk about that air in just a minute but you wanna make sure that you can reach in comfortably. Uh, in this case, from both sides, sometimes you might have to put up a garden bed up next to a structure. And if that's the case, then you need to be able to reach it just from one side. So with me, I'm vertically challenged. So I might have my garden beds only three and a half, four feet at the most because my arms are shorter than some other people's arms. You wanna be able to get all the weeds out, fertilize, and harvest everything. Now, as far as the, the soil depth, I like to recommend if you can get eight to 10 inches of soil depth at least, you'll be doing better. And what I think in the, in the fall, what's the biggest carrot I might wanna grow? So the carrot and then its little roots at the bottom. And in the spring, tomatoes, we gotta grow tomatoes, right? I mean, I know you can grow fall tomatoes, but everybody grows them in the spring and tomatoes are heavy feeders so they need to be able to have a big root system will your garden depth allow for that now the garden on the right is just a, a box garden you can build it with wood with stones um, with cinder block i like cinder block you know they might not look pretty but they're not going to rot on you so um, you can have it uh, most people will have the cinder block where the holes are facing up. Every once in a while, turn one where the smooth surface is up, and that way you can sit comfortably and do your weeding and fertilizing and harvesting. And then we have one more garden bed that's uh, down below, and it's a postage stamp garden. Um, if we can pull up that last picture. There we go. So postage stamp garden. You might not have a large yard, you might just have little areas or little area here and there. Like me, I mentioned I have some pocket gardens. As long as I know that <clears throat> it gets good sun and I can get water to it, then it's a, I consider it a good area to grow. So in the next slide, 
this is um, an idea that came, Skip Richter came as our uh, county agent several years ago, and he stayed several years with us, but he's moved on to Brazos County, Bigger and Better Pastures, and he was just bursting with ideas. So this wheelbarrow, it's a plastic one, and it had a split in the bottom. Well, it's got drainage, so there were, he also had a, a metal one that had rust holes in it. Again, it's got drainage, and you know, I mentioned the path of the sun. Maybe you kind of misjudge the path of the sun in the particular season you're in. Well, you just move your container to where it's getting the right amount of sun. So next slide, please. Um, if you've never had your soil tested before, I highly recommend you do that. Hopefully somebody can put the, um, the link to the soil sample. We have a, a form that you can fill out and it tells you how to collect your soil and everything. And, and it can really help you. So if you've never had your soil tested before, or if it's a, been a few years, I try to get mine tested about every three years. Or if I have a certain problem out in my yard that I can't figure out. You know, my plants aren't looking good. I know I'm fertilizing. I know it's getting the right amount of water and sun, but, but yet the plants aren't happy. First thing I think about is get that soil tested. What you're aiming for, um, you know, past the soil test, what you're aiming for in your garden is um, for vegetable gardening. You want it to be slightly acidic. There is this pH scale that goes from one on your left to 14 on your right. One is very acidic and 14 is very alkaline. So straight down the middle, neutral would be seven. So you're aiming for it to be slightly acidic. That's going to be ideal for most of your vegetable gardening. Um, you want to, after the first season, you want to incorporate plenty of compost. Compost is a kind of organic matter. Um, so if you can incorporate, after that first year, I mentioned two parts row soil to one part compost. So that's a third compost. But after, after you get set up the following seasons, if you can add uh, compost, that's great. Some people add a lot of compost once a year. Some people do it before each growing season, whatever is easiest for you. Um, but that compost adds a lot of nutrition to your soil. So something that you're aiming for that you can't exactly measure is you're aiming for 50% pore space. And that's a combination of air, water, and microorganisms. So with um, earlier, I mentioned about trying not to lean on your soil not to uh, step on your soil because you you compress it or you compact it and you're in essence pushing the air out so um you, that doesn't mean you have to fluff the you know fluff your garden beds to get, get air back in if you have good soil you'll have all kinds of mo microbial activity and these microorganisms they work through your soil and do all kinds of wonderful things and also uh, earthworms will come to your soil. If you have good soil, earthworms will find your soil. You don't have to haul in earthworms to your garden bed. They'll, they'll make their way to your garden bed. So earthworms, like my best friends, they, uh, they work through your soil and they're constantly eating. And then they, of course, they excrete and their excretions are called frass. Now you may have heard of um, worm castings. That's the same thing. Very good for your garden beds, the plants love it. So that's all a, a great thing that the earthworms are also doing for you. Another thing that the earthworms are doing for you as they work through your soil, soil, they create these little tiny air pockets in your soil, just ever so small. So they're helping, you know, they're helping it keep from being compacted. They're keeping a little bit of air in there. Now, as far as water, you want your soil to be moist, not dry, moist, not wet. Um, uh, the, I, I've heard the best way to test is if you can put your finger into the second knuckle and it just feels right. You know, if you try to put your finger into your soil and it's so hard that you can't get it in, then it's probably too dry. So you want to um, somehow increase the water, whether it's watering more often or more at one time, somehow you want to increase that water. And the same if you go out there and you touch the soil, maybe you poke your finger in there and it's just wet and you didn't just water, then you're 
you're going to need to adjust that water level, either ease back on the water amount that comes out each time or uh, don't water as often, or maybe you have a leak in your uh, irrigation system. So let's move to the next slide. You want to use a high nitrogen fertilizer, and I'm not advertising for these particular uh, fertilizers, but it does show you clearly on the packaging the three numbers. Any fertilizer that you get should have three numbers on it. And I have them written out right under the, the big word fertilizer. First number is always going to be nitrogen. The second number is always going to be phosphorus. And the third number is always going to be potassium. So some people, instead of saying the word potassium, they say potash. That's fine. It's, it's the same thing. But what we're aiming for with most of your vegetable gardening and certainly your fall vegetable gardening, you want that first number to be higher. So that's why they say it's high nitrogen fertilizer. But you want to use low doses of it. So the best way I describe that, you know, you can get liquid fertilizer, powder, pellet, granular, you can get all kinds of fertilizer, but say you have a liquid fertilizer and you, you want to read the label for each individual fertilizer that you get, because each one is going to tell you what they uh, or consider the best way to use their fertilizer, the right strength, the right potency. So say you have a liquid fertilizer and it says to use two tablespoons to a gallon of water. Well, I might back off on that a little bit. I might only use a tablespoon and a half or maybe even one tablespoon of fertilizer. And with the powder, granular, um, other um, forms of fertilizer, maybe it says one cup of fertilizer to a 10 foot row. Well, I might ease back on that. Maybe just three fourths of a cup or maybe just one, uh, one half of a cup and then water in. So, um, what you're trying to do is avoid burning the roots of the plant. You don't want to burn the plant and you also don't want to avoid, uh, you don't want to burn the roots of the plant. You know, you've got your plant here and it's got the roots under the soil. Here's the soil level and it's got the roots under there. So when you fertilize, you're, you're really aiming for the roots. You know, you don't, it doesn't usually need it on the plant. It usually wants it on, on the roots. So they're underground. So when you apply your fertilizer, you know, start watering it in so that that fertilizer can get to the roots. Now, if it's too strong, then you risk burning those roots. And I think of the uh, roots as kind of like its mouth, you know, in my creative mind, you know, I put food into my body through my mouth. Well, it brings nourishment into its body through its roots. So you don't want to damage those roots. So next slide, please you can see the compost on the left and the mulch on the right. The difference is compost is organic material that has already broken down. And usually you're working this into the soil, whereas mulch is hopefully organic material that has not yet broken down and you put it around your plants. Now, usually you're not going to want to build up the mulch up on your plant because it might just get it might just hold in too much moisture and the, you know, you'll have a fungal problem, it might start rotting the stem. You might also be harboring some um, naughty insects, as I like to say. So the next slide shows that we use mulch for all kinds of things. Uh, it helps hold in moisture, which, you know, in the Houston area, the Harris County area, it's just so hot. Well, around the country and around the world, even it's, it's blazing hot right now. So if we can hold in some moisture, that mulch will help us do that. Uh, it helps regulate the temperature of the soil, which helps regulate the roots under that soil. So in the summertime, it can hold that temperature down a little bit, whereas it, the reverse in the winter, it can help rise the temperature three, four, five, six degrees. So it helps with the temperature. Uh, mulch helps control weeds. It helps control unwanted insects. And if you're using organic mulch, then it gradually breaks down and becomes compost. Then you work it into the soil. And the next season after you plant your new crop, then you apply fresh uh, mulch. So how about at this point, um, Brian, do you see any questions that, 
that I might could help with? Yeah, there are lots of questions, but you know, our master gardeners <clears throat> have just done such a fantastic job of answering them. There, there's an interesting one that I don't know if, if you can answer. It, it's how deep do worms typically go? Uh, one of our viewers uh, finds them around two inches. Yeah, um, that's, that's about right. Your earthworms, they don't go real, real deep, but they'll mm -hmm. go to two, maybe four inches deep. Mm -hmm. So they're doing a lot of wonderful stuff uh, under that soil. So that's about right, two to four inches deep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and, and as I said, there's lots of great questions that have been answered. So Good. I don't want to do any of those. Um, and then, okay, what is the drawback of not non-organic mulch? Uh, so um, today we're talking about something that the end product we are going to eat. Now, I don't preach organic or non-organic, but we are talking about vegetable gardening that either I'm going to put in my body or I'm going to give it to my friends to consume. So um, these rubber mulches that you might be thinking about, they have dyes on them, so they have chemicals on them. And I just would not put that around anything that I'm going to be consuming. Now, ornamentals, you do what you want, <laughs> but today we're eating the end product. Perfect. Let's, let's do one more. And then um, I'm sure that our, because as, as we're talking, a bunch more popping in. Um, and this is, let's see, it, it kind of again talked about compost. If the compost in the box store does have a percentage of material still in it, does that make a difference? Uh, it, so hopefully it's organic material that hasn't yet broken down. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what I often see when I buy, if I buy a bag of compost, real often you'll see something that has not finished breaking down. Um, it could be that the uh, the person, uh, I'm sorry, that the company bagging it could have waited a little bit longer. But, you know, as long as there's something organic in there, like maybe chunks of pine cones or twigs or something like that, as long as it's something organic, I don't mind that because it's going to continue to break down and it'll, it'll do fine in your garden, as long as it's not mostly bigger pieces. If it's compost, it should be mostly smaller pieces in there. Excellent. You know, let's ask one more and, and as I can refer back. Um, so uh, one of our viewers is asking if it's too early to start fall roaster potatoes. And I'm going to let our, our viewers know we do have the link posted for our chart, but I'll, I'll ask quickly, um, Teresa, is it too, er too early for fall roasters? Um, you know, I'm not familiar with, I'll be oh, honest. Yukon Gold is what she said in parentheses. Okay. In our area, I think of planting the the Yukon gold and the other uh, Irish type potatoes as well. Mm -hmm. I think of planting those around um, like Valentine's Day. You might double check that chart, but I mm -hmm. think we're a little bit late on those. And I apologize. Um, now, I know that many of the crops that we do in the spring, we can later come back and, and do a fall crop like tomatoes, mm -hmm. even though I don't talk about fall tomatoes. Um, some people, a lot of people plant another crop of uh, things in the squash family and another batch of cucumbers that we think of as spring crop. So those might be fine to plant in the fall, but I think of the uh, potatoes as planting around uh, Valentine's Day. Excellent. All right, well, let's move on. And, and to our viewers, again, we're going to get back to more questions and we're going to answer them on the chat as we can. Um, so Teresa, let's let's take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the great questions too. And thank you, Master Gardeners for helping. I know Chevy's helping with questions as a Master Gardener, but I don't know who else is out there. So thank you all. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Let's start talking about uh, fall vegetables. Um, the cool season vegetables, we're usually planting between September and February, generally speaking. Um, and that can be from uh, transplants or direct seed. And I'll be talking about that. Uh, the difference between the two, and we can move to the next slide. Let's start with cabbage, the crucifer family, and we'll go ahead and keep going, and then now to the next slide. So cabbage, we're going to start with, it's a Brassica oleracea, it's scientific name. It's going to be taking up a lot of space, usually for a long period of time, at least three months, real often longer than that. Um, we're planting, a, follow that planting chart. You can start planting it in, in September through October, and you'll be harvesting 
January through April. Now that's one of those crops that you can plant some September, October, and then hope to harvest in January, uh, tussle the soil a little bit, maybe add a little fertilizer, and you can plant some more cabbage in the January period. Um, and then you'll be harvesting that in April. So not only is cabbage cold tolerant, but it has a defensive mechanism to the cold in that it sends sugars up into its leaves. And that's why when you eat cabbage, there's a slight sweet smell. It's not like eating an ice cream cone, I wish, but it does, it, it has a tendency to hold those sugars. Some crops like um, kale, it'll send sugars up, but it starts to fall. So they recommend if you're, um, if you have the opportunity to harvest kale right after a frost, you'll get a little bit of that sweetness to it. So next slide, please. Again, it's a brassica oleracea. There's all different kinds that you can grow in our area. That's my hand next to the bottom left head of cabbage. And it's just to show you that's a, that that is a smaller head of cabbage. Uh, a lot of heads of cabbage, they grow real big. And some of them only grow to a certain size, like this early golden acre. Um, you know, even when I go to the grocery store, if I'm not growing cabbage, if it's not the season, if it's only one or two I'm cooking for, or maybe three, then I'll, I'll buy a smaller head of cabbage. If you have a lot of people in the family, you might want to grow the bigger heads. So something to consider. I try to put days to harvest next to the different uh, varieties that you can grow. And you can change things up at the dinner table. You don't have to only have the green type cabbage. You can have like the top left. Uh, some people call it purple. Some people call it red. There's also textured cabbage that you can grow. This particular one is Savoy, but there's other varieties that have that texture to it. So you just change the look at things at the dinner table. Still tastes, it has that wonderful cabbage flavor. Uh, next slide, please. So again, it's a Brassica oleracea. Um, most all your vegetables have roughage, so it's good for digestion. And all of your vegetables have trace elements of all kinds of vitamins and minerals but I like to keep note of the vitamins and minerals that there's a lot of, a notable amount. And you can balance your diet if you just do a little bit of research on the different kinds of vegetables that you like. Next slide, please. So Chinese cabbage, I, I guess Chinese food is my favorite. So I always try to have some Chinese vegetables in my garden. So it's another brassica, but it's rapa instead of um, oleracea. If you go to the grocery store, real often it, they call it a Napa type with an N instead of an R. Um, so they call it the Napa type uh, cabbage. It's the same thing. So um, the next slide shows one cut in half. Oh, yum. I want some Chinese food right now. So it's a Brassica rapa. The sub variety is Picanensis. Next slide, please. So broccoli is an interesting crop in that you think of it growing for this head at the top right. Well, yes, it's gonna produce this wonderful head of cabbage, but when you harvest it, follow those stems, you know, all those curds um, go to a stem, follow those stems to where they meet together and cut it off there, but leave the plant behind. In a couple few weeks, you'll get what they call these side shoots at the bottom right. Those are side shoots. So let them grow a bit to where they look about like this picture and cut those off and leave the plant behind. And we can go to the next slide. And um, after a couple few weeks, you'll start getting more side shoots and keep doing that. Uh, keep leaving the plant behind until it no longer provides for you. Now, when you stop getting side shoots, then just pull the plant up, cut it up and put it on your compost pile. Next slide. So that's another Brassica oleracea and absolutely delicious. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the darker green vegetables are high in vitamin A. A lot of the leafy vegetables are high in vitamin A. Next slide, please. Really thank you for uh, advancing these for me, Brian. <laughs> so cauliflower is an interesting crop. I, um, that's uh, David on the left. He, David Parrish used to be in charge of our vegetable garden at Bear Creek when I first became a master gardener. And I'm pretty sure that's Gerard on the right. And I'm not positive who that is in the back. So the next slide shows a white head of cabbage. And if we can just stop at right the next one there, if we can stop right there, 
Thank you, Brian. So um, this is a white kind of cauliflower. Now cauliflower can be grown. There's a purple available. There's one that looks kind of like cheese. They call it cheddar cheese. So it's kind of golden yellowish. Uh, there's some green ones. There's, there's different colors. But when you're growing the white heads of cabbage, the ones that have the white curds or heads, you want to help do something called blanching. Now, this, uh, this, this kind of blanching is different than what you do in the kitchen with tomatoes and peppers. You're, you're trying to get that skin to peel away. That's a different kind of blanching. Here, you're trying to keep the white head or the white curds white. And this plant is trying to be self-blanching. It's trying to bring its innermost leaves around that head or those curds and, and keep it protected from the sun but they're not quite long enough and there's not quite enough of them. So what you're gonna do is pull the next innermost leaves in around that. And if we can skip past the rest of this and go to the whole next slide, there's this wonderful photographer that he and his wife, here we are and the wording, um, he and his wife both contribute to the Texas Gardener magazine, and I like to borrow <laughs> some of his uh, photographs. And of course, I like to give him credit because this is an excellent picture showing how that they pull the next innermost leaves together and they've gently pinched it off. And yet they've left enough leaves on the outside to allow for photosynthesis. So here they've used a, a clothespin. You can use a binder clips. I've used those. Um, you can use uh, the larger paper clips. You might have to use more than one, but they work well. And you can start this process when the head or the curds are, you know, kind of small, like the, about the size of my fist or maybe a little smaller. So the next slide shows, um, oh, out, out in the country, my hu husband built these wonderful garden beds for me. And this is the uh, Violet Queen. And uh, so when you cook the purple ones, they usually lose that purple. So they'll t turn kind of a chartreuse, a kind of greenish. But if you have friends over and you want to kind of show off with them, <laughs> you can serve it raw with a dip and say, oh, I grew that in my garden. So the next slide is the same photographer that um, he put a bunch of different colored ones together. So this purple, the purple I grew was Violet Queen. This is graffiti. You can guess which one is the cheddar. Um, and then the, the one kind of towards the left, uh, the top left, that's um, Veronica. It's got a texture to it. So interesting. So the next slide, please. Um, the collard, I think of such an elegant looking plant. Now, when you have these fall vegetables that grow in this mosaic form, like this, you know, they have the layers of leaves to them. What you can do, if you don't need the whole ve vegetable for the meal that you're preparing, maybe you only need two to four leaves. We'll go and cut off from the outer, you know, the bigger outer leaves and leave the inner, more tender leaves to keep growing and providing for you. And the, the plant could last all season long. Now, if you need the whole plant, of course, pull up the whole plant. But, um, you know, if you know that you like, uh, in this case, collard, if your family loves collard and y'all want to have it often, if you have room to grow several plants, you can just pull one or two or four leaves from one plant and the same with the other plants until you have enough just for the meal that you're preparing and let those plants keep growing for you. Uh, next slide, please. It's another Brassica oleracea. The subvariety is Asafala. Next slide. So kale, still a very popular vegetable. This is winter boar. Look at all that texture. And I mean, just think how much vegetable there is in each leaf. So the top right is a, another plant, but all the rest of it is one plant. And if you look at those lighter leaves that are growing in the middle, that's the new tender leaves. And they'll keep coming out like that and providing for you. So just harvest from the outside. This is you can say this is growing in that mosaic form. Now, the next slide shows one of my favorite of the kales, not just because it tastes better, but it, it's so pretty. <laughs> you don't have a lot of things blooming in the wintertime. So when this plant gets a little bigger and that cold hits it, 
look at those mid veins, how they're pink and the, the leaves are kind of purplish. So it's, it's pretty as well as tasting good. The next slide shows a kind of kale called, called Hanover salad. It's a milder flavored kale. It still tastes like kale, but it's a little bit milder. And it grows in a little bit different form. So you just kind of reach in there and, and get the leaves you need. And the next slide shows Toscano been grown in our area for a long time. Any of these um, fall vegetables that grow in this mosaic form, you know, if you if you have to leave for a couple of weeks and you've got your irrigation going, so everything's uh, growing fine, but maybe some of the outer leaves start getting tough, just just run a knife down uh, both sides of that mid vein, and that's going to be the tough part. The rest of it's going to taste fine. So I would just cut that out. And of course I do worm composting. So my worms get the best stuff. Otherwise I would just put it on my compost pile. Next slide, please. So all of the, um, so another Brasca oleracea, again, the sub variety is Asapala. And the next slide shows turnips and mustard. So um, you can go ahead and pull up that picture at the top. Thank you, Brian. So be sure and eat the greens to your turnips. I'm not going to get a chance to talk about mustards, but um, talking about turnips. Now, turnips are interesting. I keep them clustered with this group of four fall root crops. So all four of them, you want to direct seed. Now, there's a difference between transplanting and direct seed. Transplant is when you either you grow the seeds inside and you transplant it to the growing area in your garden, or maybe you bought it at a nursery and you're transplanting into your garden. Whereas direct seed is where you're taking that seed and putting it directly in your garden where it's gonna grow. So all four of these root crop, these fall root crops, beets, carrots, radish, and turnips, all four of those you want to direct seed. <clears throat> all four of those you want to harvest slightly immature so in the case of this, um, this particular turnip is purple top white globe. And you'll see in just a minute why it's called that. But um, it's about 52 days to harvest. So I'm gonna be looking in the 40s of days to harvest that and it should be ready to harvest. So all four of them you want to direct seed, all four of them you want to harvest slightly immature and all four of them you can do weekly row planting rather than planting all those seeds at the same time, harvesting all at the same time, you're going to eat a few and the rest goes in the refrigerator to start, start wilting. You can have fresh vegetables every week. So um, let's start with turnips. So say you want seven turnips, you pick the number, but I'm going to say seven turnips every week. So you go out there, you clear garden area, and you want to plant a row, and it's best to plant it in rows. It's a lot easier to water, it's a lot easier to uh, weed if you plant in rows. So you wanna plant a row, keeping in mind that the finished product, you know, the developed turnip is about, about this big around. So two and a half, three inches around. So you want to allow from center to center enough space for each turnip to grow. So you want to plant equivalent for seven turnips, tag it and date it. And then the next Monday, that was Monday morning, the next Monday, scoot down about six inches, plant your next row, ta tag it and date it. And then the next Monday, do the same and keep doing that until about the 49th day. And this purple top white globe is about 52 days. So at that point, you can check that first row and it should be ready to harvest. And if so, harvest the first row, tussle the soil a little bit, maybe add a little fertilizer and then replant that first row, re-tag it and date it. The next Monday, that second row should be ready. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. Once you start harvesting, you'll be able to harvest fresh vegetables every week instead of harvesting all at the same time, filling up your refrigerator and then eat, eat your vegetables as they're slowly wilting in the refrigerator. So we can go to the next slide, please. So you can see why it's called purple top white globe. It's another Brassica rapa. Notice the scientific name is the same as that Chinese cabbage, go figure. Um, okay, next slide, please. So with the radish, it's one of the four in that uh, group. 
uh, beets, carrots, radish, and turnips. Uh, the cherry bell at the top is very quick to harvest. It's listed at 21, 22 days. So if you do rows of them, you're going to start harvesting very fast. Uh, the next slide, please. And there's all different kinds of radish that do very well in our area that, you know, you might want to choose a different color, a different size, uh, a different shape that grows. Uh, the next slide. That's Raffina sativus. Something I find interesting about the radish, and when I think of antioxidants, I think of berries. But um, the radish has a, a notable amount of antioxidants. So again, you can change up your diet just by doing a little research. Um, so the next slide shows an Asian radish. And you can, there we go. So it's another Raffinus sativus, but the subvariety is Longipinatus. Now, most of the daikon are, grow a little bit bigger, so it's probably going to be more days to harvest. Um, a lot of the radish is uh, uh, at most 60 days, where some of the daikon that you might grow, it might even be more than 70 days. So next slide, please. And when you eat the daikon, make sure to experiment with not just savory, but sweet dishes too. So now we're moving on to lettuce. Now lettuce can be, and I think you can pick up one more picture. Yeah, there you go. So lettuce can be transplanted or you can direct seed. So you can transplant from, you know, either you grew it or a nursery grew it. You can transplant it to your garden or you can put the seed directly into the growing area. Now, if you're growing from seed, whether you're starting it inside or you're starting it outside, um, lettuce has this little tiny seed. So let's pretend that little tiny seed is this, this is your seed. So you want that seed to just make contact with the soil and then gently water it in because lettuce needs light to germinate it. Uh, lettuce seeds need light to germinate. So just have it make contact with the soil and gently water it in. Um, now you can go ahead and pull up the rest of the words on this. Now, uh, something that's interesting about lettuce, uh, I'm a grazer. I love to graze my fall vegetables. I love to go out there and pick off a leaf and, and just kind of graze. Well, lettuce, if you've ever done that with lettuce, you may have noticed the bitter bite that uh, most of your lettuce offers. <laughs> um, it's that white sap that it has. It's, it's got a kind of latex in it. <laughs> it you know, it's not going to poison you or anything. It, it just It's just a little bitter. What you can do if you know you want a salad this evening with your meal, you can go out there this morning and harvest bring it inside, gently rinse it off, gently pat dry it, and you can put it in these, you know, these produce bags you get in the produce section of the grocery store, six to eight hours, and that should alleviate that bitterness. Next slide, please. There's all kinds of lettuce that do very well, and let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, different colors and textures. The only one that doesn't do well in our area is the tight head lettuce, like that wonderful ice iceberg lettuce you buy in the grocery store, that just doesn't do very well in our area. Uh, next slide, it's a lactica sativa, yum yum. <laughs> Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So my favorite of all vegetables, uh, whether it's fall or spring, is the snow pea, love it. Um, another thing that this slide is supposed to be showing you is to consider some of the vegetables actually do better growing up rather than growing out. So a lot of the peas and beans do well like that. Maybe you've grown some um, cucumber. Real often people grow their cucumber with trellises. So keep that in mind as you're growing your various vegetables. Next slide, please. Moving on to the humble family. And I'm only going to talk about carrots. I have a slide on parsnips if we have time. And if anyone's interested, they can mention that and I will be glad. Uh, so the next slide, we'll move on to carrots. Now, carrots, one of those four fall root crops that I keep categorized together, uh, beets, carrots, radish, and turnips. So you want to direct seed and harvest slightly immature, and you can do weekly row planting. Now, carrot seeds are like the lettuce seed in that it needs light to, to germinate. So when you plant that little tiny seed, it's, you know, it's ever, ever so small, but the little tiny seed, you just want it to make contact with the soil and gently water it in. 
And generally, we're planting these seeds between October and December. I was doing a talk to the master gardeners one time, and one of the master gardeners said, oh, I plant them all year round. And another master gardener said, oh, I did too. So about three or four people uh, offered that they grow them all year round. Now, remember earlier I mentioned about cabbage, how it has that defensive mechanism in the cold that it sends sugars into its body, into in the case of cabbage, it sends it into its leaves. Well, carrots is kind of doing the same thing. That's where you get the sweetness of the carrot is the cold. So if you grow it year round and it doesn't bolt to seed, you know, sometimes that heat um, has a, a fall vegetable do what they call bolting. It, it shoots up a scape and then it, it turns to seed. Well, if it doesn't do that, then you'll get great carrots. They'll still have the carrot flavor. It's just you'll want to cook them with something a little bit sweet, maybe brown sugar, molasses, honey, you know, something to sweeten it up just a little bit. So the next slide, the last thing I have, oh, so Dacus Carrada, all kinds of cabbage that do well. Love that Touchon on the bottom right. And the next slide shows the orange rocket. Not really a great picture. I kind of borrowed it from the internet. It really looks a lot more like the Touchon but uh, tastes absolutely delicious. Again, Dacus carata. And then the next slide, we're moving on to garlic. So this is the last thing I'm scheduled to talk to you about, but if you're interested in beets or parsnips, just let me know and I can cover that too. So garlic, uh, Allium sativum, so it's an interesting crop in that um, you plant these little cloves. So here's a head. And here's a clove. Whoops, sorry. There's a clove. So the head, the head is made up of a bunch of segments called cloves. If you cook, you know the difference between a head and a clove. If you don't cook, never be ashamed of what you don't know yet. That's why we talk, because we learn. So um, say you have garlic growing out in your garden, and you have some guests coming over for dinner, and you look over to your counter for garlic, and oops, you're out of garlic. Well, don't worry, you've got that garlic growing out in the garden. You can go out there and cut off one leaf from one plant, another leaf from another plant, and as much as you need. Now, each leaf has a lot of garlic flavor, so only, only cut off as much as you need, and, and, um, and only one per plant, because remember, photo, photosynthesis, you need enough leaves for that sun to complete the feeding process of your plants. So the next slide shows a close-up of a, um, okay, so this is a garlic head that has had the outer skin removed. You know, when you buy garlic in the grocery store, it's got that paper thin skin on it, and there's, there's like two or three layers of it. But the picture here shows that skin is already pulled off. So each of those segments is a clove. So if a recipe calls for two cloves of garlic, uh, then that's what they're wanting, the two segments. And when you plant garlic, you want to plant the cloves individually. By the end of the season, each clove, you hope, will turn into a head the size of the original head. Now, we grow soft neck garlic in our area, Not, and there's soft neck and hard neck. We grow soft neck in our area, so I don't want to go to the grocery store and buy, you know, I bought these at the grocery store. I don't want to plant these in my garden because I don't know if they're hard neck or soft neck. I just go to my feed store. My feed store is Wabash. They're wonderful. They moved to uh, North Shepherd several years ago, and they've only gotten better out there. You know, you can ask them any horticulture question, and they don't guess. If they don't know the answer, I mean, they'll call over as many people as they need to to get the right answer. So I just keep calling my uh, my feed store, Wabash in my case, and find out when their garlic come, uh, comes in and they get heads of garlic. And what you want to do is uh, wait until you're ready to plant it. And so that'll be mm, October, sometimes September. So usually when it's, uh, check that chart, but um, usually when my feed store has them in, I, I go get it and I put them in the ground. So what I do is I prepare the garden bed and I don't take the skin off. So the skin, you can see my other one, I've started peeling the skin off um, just for display purposes. 
but um, I, I wait. So that's that paper thin skin. You can see how thin it is. And there's usually two or three layers of that. So I wait till I'm ready to plant this. So I walk out there with the skin art still on it and I get to my garden bed and then I start peeling the skin off. And, you know, it's, it's natural waste. So, you know, it composts in my soil. So what you want to do, your cloves of garlic, the soil level is here. You want to be an inch and a half or two inches under the soil level. That's where you want this to end up. Now with seeds, it doesn't matter, um, you know, which way it's the seed is facing, but with garlic, it does. You want to, you know, the, the part <laughs> that was the pointy end up and the roots or the basal plate where the roots were down, you know, that's how it got harvested. You want it to be the same way as you plant it. So you can see this is the pointy end and this is where the roots were. So you want that to be down. And again, you want it to be an inch and a half or two inches, sorry, under the soil. And um, that's, I think the next slide shows that it's good for you. <laughs> so are there any other questions? And if anyone's interested in parsnips or beets, I have that as well to talk about. Yeah, we have lots of questions and um, we actually have lots of people interested in parsnips or beets. So I think you're gonna have to move on. Okay. To do that. So let's do, let's do parsnips and beets. Okay. And then, then call me back when we're done and we'll do our final questions. I got a really good long, uh, longer question to ask um, that, that our master gardeners who are answering said would be a good one to answer live. So now's your, your final chance to ask all your questions so we can ask as many as we can. Um, I'm going to pop off for just a second uh, while we do the last few veggies and then I'll be right back. Thank you, Brian. So the next slide shows, I think I have beets next. Well, that's our two websites. I, I usually try to end with that, but I tacked on another couple of slides. Here's beets. So it's it's part of those four fall root crops. So you want to um, direct seed, har harvest slightly immature, and you can do those weekly row planting. Keep in mind, this is your garden. You might want to do every other week. Maybe you only want to harvest every other week. So this is your garden. You you do it, grow however many you want, and then plant at the stages you want. Now, I like to just stick with Detroit dark red, that one that's at the top. Chiaggio is just beautiful with those circles. And so, you know, again, I encourage people to change things up at the dinner table. So you might want to do that as well. Uh, the next slide shows parsnips. Never heard of parsnips before. Uh, so there we go. So uh, a, a lady friend of mine from Tennessee, uh, she was telling me about parsnips and I said, well, what do you do with them? And she said, oh, honey. And she was telling me all the ways she cooks it. Um, they don't so much have a taste of their own. They kind of, it's kind of like um, tofu, you know, it kind of picks up flavors, but you add it to soup, stews. You can, you know, I always say soup, stews, stir fries, but you can add it to other dishes or you can make it a side dish of your own and just use, um, you know, wonderful seasonings. I like to experiment with different seasonings. Now it grows a lot like carrots grow. So um, I always direct seed mine when I, when I get a chance to grow them. They take longer, quite a bit longer than carrots. You know, a lot of carrots, the average is about 60 to 70 days of harvest, you know, harvest days. Whereas your parsnips, as you can see, it might be four months or more with some of these parsnips. Now, these two varieties I have listed, the Harris model and the hollow crown are the two that I've tried and I know do well in this area, but I'm sure there's other ones that do great in the area. So it's just another kind of uh, vegetable that you might want to try. So I think that's it, unless anybody has any other questions on those. Thank you for ending with this slide. Oh yeah, I figure we'll leave it on here. And um, th that was wonderful. I'm actually gonna ask a really quick question and I'm gonna jump in. Uh, are golden beets able to be uh, grown here in Harris County? Because those are my yes. favorite type of beet. Yes, absolutely. There's so many other colors of mm -hmm. beets that you can grow. Anytime you get a chance to change anything at the dinner table, there's golden ones, there's white ones. I haven't seen so, white. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, people will look at that and, and they'll say, that's a beet. <laughs> and, and do keep in mind when you're growing those red ones, as you bring them into the kitchen and you're cutting them up, 
that red juice will dye your white clothes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so your lighter colored clothes. So and, be and careful with that. Will die too. Yes. <laughs> they all will. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that that is great. I thought it was a lot of fun at the end, and 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 I've actually used parsnips myself. I um I've made them into kind of oven fries, like you would a potato, uh, and you can do a mix of potato, carrot, and parsnip. Just chop them up like a French fry and bake them, and then oh, you have kind of a nice little summer mix. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Always like to hear what other people are cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, <laughs> me too. Um, so let me ask the longer question, and I'm going to jump back in and see what else we have. Um, so we have a, a, a viewer who currently has a yard with ornamental plants, and they're wanting to switch it to vegetable, um, but they've used herbicides in the past. Um, is it safe? And how long does it take for those, those chemicals to disappear? Or should they dig out all the dirt and just place it with organic? Uh, so really good question. Some of your herbicides only last um, like 24 hours, like that weed and feed. It's usually 24 hours. And now I wait longer <laughs> and I try, I still try not to use that around my vegetables, but some of those herbicides stick around. You know, there's that, um, I'm sorry, I said weed, yeah, weed and feed. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> What is the other one that has the atrazine? If it has atrazine in it, that sticks around forever. So I just would not use that. Melvin, what's that uh, herbicide we spray? Uh, Roundup. Roundup. I'm sorry. I used the wrong word. So weed and feed sticks around. Roundup only sticks around for 24 hours. Real important. Weed and feed has atrazine in it. So if you have used that in your yard, um, it's it's going to be out there. So I would, if you can, dig up the soil or grow in a different spot. Um, but Roundup it is only 24 hours, and that should be safe. So That's I apologize for that misspeak. <laughs> no, I think that will help help our viewer really well. Um, I'm going to ask another couple quick uh, quick ones. Um, did you mention when to fertilize garlic after planting, or should you? Yes, yes. Uh, garlic does like a little fertilizer. So the same thing with a high nitrogen fertilizer. I dilute mine and keep in mind where the roots are. So you have your, I have to use something else as my plant. I've got a pen here. So um, here's your, pen, your uh, plant, you know, the leaves coming out of your garlic. And remember the roots are down under. So that's where you're aiming that fertilizer is, you know, the roots, the roots that are down under the soil. So yes, the same high nitrogen fertilizer, I dilute mine, and I still try to fertilize about every seven days, if at all possible. Perfect. And uh, I, I see our master gardeners are answering a lot of questions. Um, I wanted to ask this one as well, uh, with the increased uh, heat that we're getting, and that might go longer, should anybody um, change their, their planting schedule to accommodate for that? Should we be planting maybe a little bit later into our fall beyond what the schedule that we posted says another really great question all of these are great questions so some people are going to be planning a little bit later mm -hmm. and just keep watching the weather uh, some people will um, try to shadow the area okay now you can't just move a tree in front of something <laughs> but some people actually put uh, not tarp because tarp is going to completely block the sun but if you can somehow string up some frost cloth or something like that that allows some sun to come in mm -hmm. now there is floating row cover and there's frost cloth floating row cover if you can get that up that still allows about 80 85 percent of sunlight penetration frost cloth is going to block out more more uh, sun so if you can string up something like that for the hot afternoon sun then you might get started at the regular time. Otherwise, that's a great question. Some people are going to be starting later than that. And, you know, it's strange with vegetable gardening and any kind of gardening, we always have to go by what Mother Nature is giving us. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I appreciate that question. Really great one. Excellent. And, and, you know, every time I look at another question to ask, uh, our, our master gardeners ha have answered it. So I really think that, that we did a pretty good job. We got to everybody. If we haven't gotten to your question just yet, the, our, our master gardeners are still going through everything and, and answering them all. Um, so I think we're going to call it that for today. I'm looking up our next master gardeners program will be Tuesday, August 16th. 
on Herbs 101. So make sure you join us on Tuesday, August 16th at 11 o'clock. It's always the third Tuesday a month. We run up until October and then we take November, December off and then usually jump back in in January. Um, so we have a few more to go. Um, Herbs 101 coming. I just want to thank you, Teresa, for a great program. We had a lot of viewers today. I think everybody really enjoyed uh, the seminar. Um, if you have any questions or if you need to see anything that we talked about, this is going to be back up on the website in about five minutes. You can go back and pause as you need. Uh, please reach out to the Harris County Master Gardeners with any questions that you have. They love answering questions. And keep an eye on that chat. We're going to keep answering the questions as we go. Uh, Teresa, thank you again for a great program. Thank you all of our viewers. And we will see you uh, next month. Thank Bye, everybody. You all. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.